Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new this child that you deliver will soon deliver you mary did you know that your baby boy would give sight to a blind man mary did you know your baby boy would calm a storm with his hand. Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? And when you kiss your little baby, you've kissed the face of God. Mary, did you know? The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again. The lame will leave, the dumb will speak, the praise is Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? This sleeping child you're holding is a great I am. Mary, did you know Well, good evening. Merry Christmas Eve. Let me ask you to stand and join in singing, O Come All You Faithful. Oh 
this is a special time for us, Father, to bow before you on this holy night with a depth of feeling that we usually don't have any other time of the year, this moment when we find ourselves worshiping you on the night that we celebrate the birth of your Son. We ask, Father, that you would receive our worship as it comes, as we bring ourselves to your place, set aside for such things, and talk to you about the concerns of our lives and concerns of our families, and to present to you everything that we are as a sacrifice of worship. We pray for those of our family who are having tough days, and ask, Lord, that you would anoint them in a special way with your presence and that we might become your presence with them as we make contact and, and touch their life. We celebrate the fellowship of the people of God when we gather together around the symbols that have become traditions of ours where we say to each other that we love each other, and Merry Christmas, and Happy New Year. To light our candles, to celebrate around the Christmas tree and exchange gifts. Father, all of that, we see our symbols that point to the Messiah, that point to the Christ child. And we pray, Father, that you will find us tonight rededicating ourselves to his light. And I pray this in his name. Amen. And while they were there, uh, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end. It's hard enough to travel a long distance that you were not planning to make some 130 miles worth from Nazareth to Bethlehem. But Joseph and Mary made it even with the anticipation of giving birth at any moment. And then to get to that place and find out that there's no place for them to rest, the actual word in the text means a guest room. No one had any vacancy anywhere simply because there were hordes of people who had traveled from all directions to the town of David, Bethlehem, in order to be registered for the census. It's interesting how the government always gets in the way of plans. Government demands sometimes override the design of God, we would think, in this instance. But not so. God's design was to come incarnate, in the flesh, so that humanity would see him in all of his truth, grace, and glory. And in that regard, God is never upset when man gets in the way. He always finds a way to make sure his word and his message gets across. Some have even written about how the Nativity family got crowded out by man's ego. And some would probably on the surface would see that, but we know better. Because a stall was provided, somehow the child was born and everyone came and realized that this was a Messiah, a Messiah, someone who was going to bring salvation to the world. And he was going to have a ministry to make sure that that would take place. And in fact, you can take almost all the aspects of the Christmas story and it foreshadows the conduct and the situation and circumstances of Jesus' ministry. 
Mary and Joseph found no room, and that became the hallmark of our Savior's ministry. There was no room for his teaching. His claim that he was the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and that he was presenting God's word met with opposition in certain instances infuriating the crowd so much that they sought to stone him or throw him off a cliff or in other ways murder him. And he said to them, these were the religious people who were trying to do this, the ones who were looking for the Messiah. But there was no room for Jesus' type of teaching. He said, I know that you are the offspring of Abraham. You're a part of the covenant. Yet you seek to kill me because, listen to this, my word finds no place in you. Now I look back over my life, I see those moments and situations where I needed a word from the Lord. He provided it, but there was no room in my heart and mind to hear it, much less accept it. Well, there was no room for his teachings, but there was no room for his miracles either. People wanted the signs and wonders, to be sure, but there were instances where the miracles were not welcome. In fact, there was one moment in the town of Gadarene where he healed a demoniac. And the demons begged not to be cast into the abyss and asked permission of the Son of God. Can you believe this? Even the devil recognizes that Jesus is the Son of Man, the Son of God. He said, what do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Don't send us into the abyss. Let us go into the swine instead. Do you remember that story? And he gave permission, and they entered the swine, and the swine just create all kinds of havoc, squealing all the way down the cliff and into the sea and drown. Of course, that was the economy of the area. So immediately, the herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed man. And behold, all the city came out to meet him, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. They would have nothing to do with that miracle because it upset their economy. It scared them to death what else he might do and what other gods might be offended by his action. Sadly, there was no room for Jesus in his hometown. Do you remember that one? And they took offense at him. This is when he was reading from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61. The prophecy of the Messiah. The healing of the sick and bringing the dead alive and the blind would see and the lame would walk. And then he said, Jesus said, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Quite a claim. And they took offense at him, and Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Even his hometown did not accept him. Jesus even admits to his disciples that there was no place for him. He would say to them, I didn't come to bring peace. What's going to follow is the sword. People are going to be offended at what I do, what I say, because it upsets the status quo. It changes the tradition. And there's no room for those kinds of changes in people's lives. But yet Jesus proclaimed it as necessary for them to be a part of the kingdom of God, to be a part of the rulership of God in the world and in one's life. You have to listen to the words and you have to look 
secular works to make sense of life. But people were too busy. People were too hung on their own interest. And he tells his disciples as he's beginning to prepare them for the ministry that they're going to carry on after his resurrection. He said to them, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Hallelujah. What a Savior. I like a Savior like this. He calls it as he sees it. He recognizes things for what they are. He doesn't wear rose-colored glasses. He doesn't try to make things look better than they are. He's a realist. In the purest sense of the word, he was telling his disciples, look, you follow me, it's going to be a tough wall, not a bed of leaves. When you say end up, he said, for the Lord's work, then what will happen is they will call you demons. They will call you traitors. They will call you illegal. But the Lord will give you what to say. It's been that way for generations. That there have been people who have stepped forward to receive Christ as Savior and would have admitted to Him that they will follow him, and they understand in many ways that they are going to be upsetting people because they love the Christ. They accept the deity of Christ where they do not. And there's no room for that kind of talk these days. There's no room in the school. There's no room in the law. There's no room for the Pledge of Allegiance. There's no room for the things that we hold dear to have a little bit of God, a little bit of Christ in them. No room. No vacancy. But instead of me pointing fingers at other things and other ideas, I have to point back to myself and realize I have made no room for Him. Haven't you? where I've gotten all the things cluttered up into my heart and my thinking and my mind, worried about this and that, trying to get this accomplished and that accomplished, fulfill this schedule, this expectation, and you can just go on and on, and it it mounts up to where we wonder, what's my next step? Well, we've all felt it and we all know it. There has to be a moment where we make room for our Lord, even if it's just a little bit, can change a great deal. Do you not find it interesting that the one who found no room for his teachings, for his miracles, there was no room for his birth, no room for him to lay down his head, there was no place that he could call home, would turn around and say, my father and I will come and make our home with those who believe. And he would also say, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God because, and believe also in me, because In my Father's house are many rooms. And if it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. Hallelujah. What a Savior. The one who I have not given full room to, he tells me, I'm making room for you so where I am, you can be also. So the counsel tonight that I would offer to you is to, in the in middle of all of the, the symbols, the tree, the candle, the candles, the poinsettia, even the communion that we're going to be sharing in just a moment, 
in all of the none of those bring significance to life except that you see the message behind them. For instance, the Advent carol. The prophet's candle, the angel's candle, the shepherd's candle, the Bethlehem candle, all of these represent something special. They, they tell us a story. What was the first one that we did? The prophet's candle, wasn't it? That there was a prophecy of a Messiah, and the prophecy was given. Isaiah, Daniel, Micah, Jeremiah. But the prophecy's done. Jesus has already prophesied what his second coming is going to be like. So there's no more prophecy other than what we have already received. What was the next candle? Shepherds? Shepherds came. They saw the Christ child in a manger. And what did they do? After they had seen him, they went back and told the news of everything that had been told to them. Now the Christian church has that child not shepherds. The angels came and told them, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill to men. The angels did their thing, announcing peace. The Bethlehem candle where they found no room breaks my heart when I think about that chaos that was being experienced by them. Please know that Mary and Joseph, it was not easy at all. And these little nativity scenes that you see that are all soft gold and, and nice and warm and all that kind of stuff, it wasn't that way. If you find the coldest place out there tonight, the roughest place out there tonight, and that's the kind of situation. But you know what that tells us? Is that God made the decision to come to that kind of situation to tell you and me, I want to identify with where you are. I want you to know that I understand the human dilemma. Glory unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And that government will never end. That's what the Christian church celebrates, is the lordship of Christ. And everything that has led up to this moment has pumped us up for this moment to get ready to continue the ministry that God has called us to. And every single one of us who has Christ in their heart and you have claimed him as your Savior, you have a mission just like the prophets, just like the shepherds, just like the angels, just like Mary and Joseph. The light of Christ has come into your heart, come into your life. Is there room for that light to shine in you? Let's stand as we sing. Amazing grace, how 
Mighty Father, as we prepare to receive of the remembrance of the Lord's Supper, we thank you for bringing to mind the sacrifice of his life for our own, that we could be forgiven of sin, and that we could no longer be held captive by it, but that we could live free, lives that love you and lives that help others and to love others. So as we receive this symbol, let us remember of the love of Christ for us, but also through the love that we should have for each other. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. On the night that Christ was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, and uh, he gave thanks for it. He said, this is my body that is broken for you. In the same manner, he took the cup and he blessed it and gave thanks for it. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant that is shed for the remission of sin. And then he said one most fantastic thing. It's probably the greatest hope of the Christian people. He says, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again till I drink it new with you when we're in my Father's kingdom. Tonight as you pass the bread and the cup, I ask that you pass it with the remembrance of that sacrifice, but also too with that brother or sister that's sitting beside you. And would you say to them, I love you in Jesus' name.
ضعيف خالص Almighty Father, I cannot understand the pain that our Lord must have felt when his body was pierced and when the edema was taking him from this world. The, the sheer tragedy of the moment must have been shocking. But as we stand here at this moment and look back those thousands of years, we recognize that at that moment, Humanity and divinity were joined in a battle between good and evil. The good won, and you kissed us with the salvation of the blood of Christ. We celebrate that in his holy name. And all the people said, Amen. make a commitment now to let our light shine. Christ is the most important thing in all of this world. Everything, everything, when you read scripture, everything is pointing to Christ, pointing to Christ, always to Christ. Let's sing.
thank you for this wonderful moment to remember and tomorrow where we come to celebrate the birth of the Christ. Grant that we will have safe travel, enjoy our families, and celebrate the fact that we are redeemed through the blood of the Lamb and that we have a Master, a Lord, that loves us and cares for us and will not discard us. And we celebrate that in the holy name of Christ our Lord. Amen. On behalf of the church and on our church staff, let me wish you a merry, merry, merry Christmas, one that is filled with Christ all the way. Amen. God bless you. We wish you a merry Christmas. We wish you a merry Christmas. We wish you a merry Christmas and a happy new year. With tidings we bring to you and your kin. Good tidings for Christmas and a happy new year. We wish you a merry Christmas. We wish you a merry Christmas. We wish you a merry Christmas and a happy